Welcome back. Today, we have the honor of hosting a diverse panel of esteemed guests, all united by a shared goal, to educate the next generation of leaders. Our first topic of discussion revolves around the recent Supreme Court ruling against affirmative action, which has evoked a range of emotions among citizens. To fully grasp, grasp the implications of this ruling, it is crucial to delve into the rich historical context and the multifaceted arguments that have shaped affirmative action as we know it today. Joining us in person is the Associate Professor of Law at City University of New York Law School, Victor Good, while joining via Skype is a Professor of History and African American Studies at Fordham University, Dr. Mark Nyson. Together, they will shed light on the intricacies and significance of affirmative action. I want to thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Now, Dr. Nyson, what is affirmative action in the context of higher education, which will be our focus today? Right. Affirmative action began in higher education in the mid-1960s in the context of the riots and uprisings who, which spread throughout American society in urban areas from 1964 to 1968. As a result of that, America's universities decided that if African Americans were not included into uh, the, the nation's elite universities, the society could not hold together. So students who had previously gone to HBCUs were uh, recruited by all the nation's top universities to the point where at schools like Fordham and Columbia, uh, the percentage of black students enrolled multiplied by six times between 1964 and 68. And um, after that took place, uh, black students and their allies at these schools fought to have a critical mass of black and Latino students at these schools, uh, even uh, if it meant changing admissions qualifications. So by the early 1970s, every major university in the United States um, had a uh, critical mass of black and increasingly Latino students. And um, this was done not through legislation. It was done by elites who feared that the country could not survive if it didn't have a significant cadre of leaders from these two groups. Now, can you describe the three significant moments that shaped affirmative action in the U.S.? Okay, first of all, the, the, the uprisings that led to the creation of affirmative action in the 60s. Without those uprisings, universities, corporations, and government would not have embraced affirmative action. The second big moment was the Bakke case in 1968, where the Supreme Court banned uh, most of the strategies universities used to recruit uh, underrepresented students and said they could only do so through purposes for purposes of diversity through very limited uh, admission strategies. And then I would say the third moment was in 1996 when uh, the state of California passed Proposition 209 banning um, the use of affirmative action for uh, either for race or gender in admissions, contracting, and employment in the state of California. Those are my three big moments. And I want to just reiterate, can we talk about, because I know there's a lot of controversy or just a lot of opinions about affirmative action and why it was established. Can you just uh, talk about that and expand on it a little bit more? Right. Um, affirmative action was not something fought for by the mainstream civil rights movement. It was something created by white elites um, in desperation because um, the the civil rights laws did not bring about the needed changes to make the United States a society where black people um, had real representation in the economy or the educational system. It was done um, 
as a sort of desperate measure to hold the society together. But after it was done, um, the, uh, the civil rights community embraced it as the only effective strategy to assure that uh, black people and other uh, underrepresented groups had a real stake in the country's institutions. It was forged in the fires of uh, an uprising that took place in American society in the mid-60s. Um, it wasn't a product of legislation. Well, thank you so much for you know expanding on that. Now, Victor, can you tell us about two cases that were just decided on? Well, um, let me preface that by saying that the, the story of affirmative action, like most stories, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Dr. Nason has talked a little bit about the, uh, the beginning. Unfortunately, last week, we witnessed the end of affirmative action in the cases where uh, students, uh, uh, Asian students, who believe that they had been discriminated against uh, Harvard University, at Harvard University, uh, filed a lawsuit alleging discrimination and alleging that Harvard's affirmative action program was, in fact, unconstitutional. Uh, two cases were combined, Harvard and University of North Carolina case. They went up to the Supreme Court. Oral arguments were last fall. And last week, the Supreme Court issued a 6-3 to three opinion uh, holding that uh, affirmative action is unconstitutional. Uh, it uses racial classifications in violation of the 14th Amendment and that it is effectively over as far as higher education is now concerned. Now, I want to expand on that a little bit more because as we heard, this wasn't necessarily the first time we've seen a situation mm -hmm. like this. Um, I understand like the Baki case was mentioned, yes. and I think you have a little bit of history with that. Can you just tell yes. us a little bit more about that? Yes, yes. Uh, when affirmative action first got started, it wasn't a, a federal program, and it certainly wasn't a well-designed, coherent policy in its early days. Uh, different colleges were doing different things to increase the enrollment of blacks and Latino students. Uh, it became known as affirmative action over time by the mid-1970s mid because uh, President Johnson made a speech in 1965 at Howard University. And in Johnson's sort of folksy way, he said, it's not enough to loosen the shackles on someone who had been bound bring them to the starting line of a race and expect them to perform in the race the same as everyone else. And then he added that for some time for the future, there would have to be some extra steps taken uh, to assist those who had been the victims of discrimination. And from that folksy statement by President Johnson, uh, affirmative action programs began to have a coherent uh, direction. And essentially, they meant using race as a factor in the admissions process, weighing it in some ways uh, as universities sought to, uh, to uh, enroll their student body. Now, what were the arguments made on both sides in the most recent two cases? Well, let me preface that by saying a little bit more about the Bakke case. Uh, the Bakke case dealt with affirmative action in a medical school. And the Supreme Court split on that case. Four justices said that these programs were unconstitutional. Four justices, the liberal wing of the court, said that these programs not only were constitutional, but there was a real distinction between the use of race as a plus or a benefit to remedy the impacts of past discrimination and racism in society uh, versus the use of race in the Jim Crow era, which was used exclusively, of course, to exclude people. The deciding vote was by Justice Powell. And Justice Powell says, I don't agree with affirmative action as a remedy for societal discrimination. But I do think it has an educational value. Uh, and I point to Howard, I mean Harvard University as a, a good example of that. Har Harvard uses what they call the holistic admissions process, where race is considered one amongst many factors to evaluate an applicant. And as long as universities do that, we're willing to defer to them and let them proceed uh, uh, with a, uh, a controlled and minimal use of racial classifications. Uh, fast forward, of course, that the, the middle period of this story 
Uh, we go from Bakke to Croson to the Gruder case, and these are cases in which there's a, there's a debate within the court as well as a growing debate within society. First, over whether or not race should be used at all, but secondly, if it is used in, a, in higher education, how would it be used and how would you control its use in some ways so that it wouldn't become what the, uh, the critics said is uh, um, uh, an unconstitutional, unconstitutional use, of, use of race. Now something very significant happened in those cases that runs parallel to this conversation about affirmative action. The court had on several opportunities, uh, several, several cases, an opportunity to say that affirmative action isn't just because of past discrimination. Affirmative action is justified because discrimination hasn't left society. It is ongoing, and it is showing up in many, many of our institutions. They rejected that idea completely and narrowed affirmative action down to only for the purposes of diversity, only in classrooms, and only because diversity in a classroom benefited, quote unquote, all students. And by that, they meant it wasn't that black students or Latino students were going to be the specific beneficiaries of affirmative action. White students had the benefit as well. And as long as they did for educational reasons, the program would, would be allowed to continue. And so what started off and could have been a, um, what we might call the new reconstruction uh, got narrowed down, narrowed down, and narrowed down to this really thin piece of ground called diversity. And of course, last week, the court struck that down. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Dr. Nyson, I, I kind of want to get um, your opinion on this, considering your background in African American studies um, and how race is a huge part of this. Can you just talk about the idea of, you know, just diversity in the classroom and how some people are seemingly or, you know, are against this and um, the implications that could have on higher education in America? Um, the right now we have an organized campaign by the American right against a concept, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was uh, emerged out of the Black Lives Matter movement as a strategy to make all of our institutions more inclusive and more fair. And so the historic attempt to eliminate all forms of racial preference um, in higher education, which has been going on since the 1970s, today has fused with a broader attack on the whole concept of diversity as a value in American society. So, you, you know, uh, in the past, the uh, opponents of affirmative action uh, appealed to the ideal of a colorblind society now they've taken it a step further to see any institutional support for diversity as a threat. Um, so we're facing a major crisis right now coming not just from the court, but from organized opposition to all forms of uh, promotion of diversity. And I think we have to fight back against that tooth and nail. We have to demand that the diversification of our universities continue, that the diversification of our corporate corporations continue, that the diversification of the workplace and the culture continue. And personally, I don't believe that the Supreme Court can stop any of that, no matter what decisions they make. Um, let me say one more thing about the, the, the power of the Supreme Court. In 1954, a unanimous Supreme Court issued a decision banning segregation in public schools. Six years later, only 2% of uh, Southern school districts had been desegregated. We just got a six to three decision 
from the Supreme Court. There is no reason that our institutions should abide by that decision. Um, and I am really pleased that my own university and so many others has reaffirmed its commitment to diversity. Let the Supreme Court declare, but then who is going to enforce their decision? Um, that's the question I have. I don't think the battle is over. I think it's just begun. Thank you for sharing. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that as well. Well, certainly there's going to be more battles fought over affirmative action. Uh, in addition to um, uh, what Dr. Nason is telling us about Fordham, I'm sure other schools are going to do the same. Now, there's some schools that, in the aftermath of the Bakke decision, sort of looked down the road and said, you know, this narrow ground of diversity is not going to hold up over time. And they already, already switched to what we call, or what they, they refer to as a disadvantaged student model. And that is, they said, look, all students can point to certain disadvantages that they faced in their educational matriculation, white students, black students, Latino students, and can include that in their college essay. And we, as uh, college uh, enrollment offices, can take that into account. That typically meant that for students of color, they could talk about their lived experience in a society in which race and racial discrimination still plays a major obstacle in their efforts to achieve equity and equality. I suspect that a lot more schools are going to do something similar. And I also suspect that, as Dr. Nason pointed out, this well-organized uh, attack from the right is going to generate some more lawsuits. There will be more litigation. It's going to spread out over the next couple of years, and we'll see what the court respond, how the court responds. Uh, to those efforts. Now, yeah. I'm curious. I, oh, yeah, you can definitely add to that. I would say affirmative action began when people took to the streets, and it'll survive uh, in different forms when people take to the streets and, and occupy buildings. Um, you know, I'm a historian of protest in America, and it's important to remember Affirmative action did, was not a result of legislation. It was a result of protest. Now, I'm curious to know, you know, since both of you have such an extensive background in education, um, you know, what are your thoughts on the future? Do you think, you know, this decision could change the way classrooms look, you know, throughout America? Um, or as you possibly mention you, you're, you know, a little bit more hopeful that colleges uh, will do what they can to ensure that those classrooms at least uh, stay uh, diverse or promote inclusivity? I think there's going to be a mix, but let's be honest. Most colleges and universities are actually fairly conservative places, and most state legislatures have appointed administrations to ensure that that be the case. Um, uh, Dr. Nason mentioned Proposition 209 in California. And there were similar propositions in Washington State and in Michigan that effectively banned affirmative action. And when that happened, the most selective universities in those states saw a precipitous drop in enrollment of black and Latino students, I think as much as like 50 or 60 percent in some cases. Now, some of those schools have done a few things to rebuild those numbers somewhat but nowhere near the levels that they were when they had formal affirmative action programs. So I think there's going to be a real mix of things that will happen with our colleges and universities. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of cautious and a little worried that a lot of these schools are simply going to be adverse to litigation and are going to pull back and their numbers of, of students of color are going to fall. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to do is where schools like that happen, students have the option of uh, doing what they did in the 1960s. Um, if it's important enough for students to have uh, diverse classrooms, to have a diverse community, that's something that they're going to have to fight for. I also think it's important to understand that the, we're talk, the, the schools that are going to be affected are going to be the, the 100 elite colleges in the United States. 
There are 4,630 institutions of higher education in the United States, including community colleges. And um, of those, uh, you know, more than 4,000, less than 100 are really selective. And uh, so that's where the impact will be on the selective schools. Um, I suspect that in, in schools in the Bronx, uh, this will have no impact whatsoever. Um, and uh, in, in, in most universities, it won't. But uh, unfortunately, these hundred schools have a disproportionate influence in, um, in, in shaping the leadership stratum of American society. So th that's a serious consequence. But I don't think tomorrow at Lehman or Fordham or Hostos mm -hmm. or Manhattan College there's going to be any significant change in what uh, our classrooms look like. Uh, but at Columbia, at NYU, uh, possibly, and at Harvard and Yale and Princeton, uh, which are going to be carefully monitored, uh, quite possibly. That's a good point, Mark, because actually most of the schools in the countries don't have affirmative action programs and haven't had them for many years, if ever at all. Uh, but the debate is over these elite schools because these elite schools have become the feeder institutions to major institutions of government, uh, business, industry, finance, and so forth. These are where the quote-unquote leadership uh, 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 elites are training uh, the future quote-unquote leaders of the country. And yeah. it's looking, it's beginning to look like those, those, those numbers are, are going to become uh, 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 wider as as this well, battle but let me say, yeah, let me say one thing because this is that ever since the Baki decision, these schools have given more and more admissions preferences to wealthy whites mm. through legacy admissions, and even more important through athletic preferences for sports which you have to be wealthy to play. You know, twenty percent. Of Ivy school of students at the Ivy League colleges are are admitted with athletic preference for sports like golf, tennis, uh, crew, sailing, lacrosse, which costs tens of thousands of dollars to play. If we want to make those institutions more equitable, get rid of legacy admissions and get rid of athletic admissions, and then maybe. The impact of, uh, of of the Supreme Court decision will be less. And interestingly enough, civil rights groups are suing these schools to end legacy admissions. Mm -hmm. And today, one of them, Wesleyan College, announced that it is ending legacy admissions. But I say they also go after athletic admissions, even though both of my children ended up getting to, into Yale through that channel. And uh, there were more uh, students with lower SATs and grades admitted through athletic preferences to the Ivies than through race-based preferences. Let me say There's something to your audience about, about legacy admissions. Legacy yes, admissions please. are basically the alumni of an institution who are cultivated to give money to that institution that they graduated from. And in fact, they give tens of millions of dollars to these elite, elite schools. And in the Harvard case that was just decided, 40% of all students admitted were from the alumni of Harvard University. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm curious to know, you know, in the long run, in the future of this, you know, how could this affect the very people that were maybe against? Because uh, not everyone um, who's, who's against affirmative action uh, maybe comes from a wealthy background or anything like that. How could this uh, potentially affect some of those people in the long run? I want to pick up on, on what Mark said about this, this being something that has to be moved by political action more than just legal action. Uh, we began losing the cases for affirmative action in the court of public opinion before we finally lost them in the actual courts of law. And that is because the relentless attack, the relentless undermining, the relentless uh, mischaracterizations of, of affirmative action have convinced many people in the country, including many people of color, uh, 
that this program was, in fact, unfair. And why yeah. should someone endorse a pro program that's unfair, even if they might benefit from them themselves? Actually, yeah. these programs uh, were to promote the very equity that Johnson talked about in 1965. Uh, they have been mischaracterized in many ways. And they have had the beneficial effect of causing colleges and universities to reevaluate their admissions process in a positive way that affects all applicants, not just applicants of color. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a, I actually started teaching a course on affirmative action uh, in in the end of the 90s because my white students were absolutely convinced yeah. that they didn't get into Columbia or uh, Princeton because a black or a Latino student got um, in uh, an unfair advantage and got in with lower SATs and grades. But then I had the experience where my daughter, who was a nationally ranked tennis player, uh, was recruited by every Ivy League school, and Harvard sent her a letter saying, dear so-and-so, uh, we'd like you to get 1,100 in your SATs. Um, <laughs> And I did start <clears throat> investigating, and it turned out that by uh, the late 90s, being a recruited athlete had twice the admissions potency of being an underrepresented minority. Um, and a book about this was written called The Game of Life. And then I began to see that the, the colleges had all these ways of giving wealthy students an admissions advantage far greater than what they were doing through affirmative action. So if you're going to say that universities are unfair uh, because uh, some black and Latino students are admitted with slightly lower, um, you know, SATs and grades than uh, the college norm, what about the, the, the white students who are coming in that way who actually outnumber uh, those uh, students of color. And so the whole fairness argument about a, a race-based affirmative action has to be turned on its head and saying, if this is unfair, there are other forms of unfairness which are even greater. Why don't you target those? I think So I think it's time to go after legacy admissions mm -hmm. and athletic preferences of admissions and go hard after both of those. Well, I want to, you know, thank you both so much for, you know, joining us on this discussion. I definitely learned a lot. And I think that's a really great question uh, to leave off with, you know, how our viewers think about. Uh, but once again, I want to thank the both of you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you, Dr. Good, for, uh, you know, this brilliant presentation on the legal history, which I think, um, you know, our audience will really benefit from. And Dr. Um, Mason, it was it was great reconnecting with you again. Yes.